Great. Uh, so welcome. Um, thank you again for joining. Um, uh, we hope that you have found um, Halfway to I2K uh, a great experience so far and that you continue to be able to find tutorials that really um, help you out during the rest of the couple of days. Um, my name is Beth Simony. I'm the Associate Director for Bioimage Analysis at the Imaging Platform at the Broad Institute. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be joined today by three amazing uh, postdocs from the Broad, um, Suganya Sivagaranathan, uh, Palianos, and Shadavisha Dasgupta. And so they will be your TAs for today. Um, and just to give you an idea of what the next couple hours are going to look like, um, we're going to start with an introduction to cell profiler, cell profiler analyst, and why you might use them. You don't actually have to use cell profiler and cell profiler analyst together, but they, they are certainly designed to be used together. And so um, it, it's important to sort of understand what the connection between those two pieces of software is. Um, together in this main room, um, we will run cell profiler to create files that cell profiler analyst can then use for our hands-on exercise. And then we're going to put you into small group breakout rooms, um, and together you'll work as a team to use Cell Profiler Analyst to answer a biological question. Um, usually the way we do this is we have one person in the room screen share while the other while other folks in the room give them advice based on the slides and based on the written exercise that you're, you'll be provided with if you downloaded the materials. Um, so please, we would, it's, it'll be great if the majority of people are planning to run the exercise and not, uh, uh, and are able to do this so that we have at least one person in each room who can. Um, but since we are going to be working in teams, um, if for whatever reason you're not able to do this, um, please do stick around. Um, you can definitely help participate and guide your teammate through the exercise. Um, especially folks who are on Mac Sonoma. Yesterday, when we did the Intro to Cell Profiler workshop, um, we were made aware of a bug that was causing crashes in Cell Profiler. Um, hopefully, that was just a couple people's random computers. But um, if this does end up affecting you, we're working on a fix. But uh, we just found out about this last night, so we don't have it yet today. Uh, so the biological question we are going to be trying to solve today is um, as a translocation question. So this is real data from a real experiment um, where uh, what man is being used to cause uh, translocation of a transcription factor called FOXO1A, which has been GFP tagged, um, to try and figure out what is the dose that uh, causes, I, work, uh, causes this translocation into the nucleus. And so on the left, you have the negative control where there's uh, no wart mannan added and no translocation. Um, on the right, you have a really high dose of wart mannan, and we'll be calculating sort of what the IC50 is and looking at a dose response curve. Um, so this is, again, sort of real biological information. And by the end of this workshop, you will be able to, to do this on your own. Um, but again, just to sort of start with what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, you know, the there is this long history of image analysis not being a technical thing. And for most of the history of microscopy, we haven't actually done quantitative analysis. We've just relied on people's reports on what they saw. Um, if we're very lucky, uh, the person who's reporting it is a great artist, like this uh, drawing here from Ramoni Cajal. But for the most part, quantitative analysis is a pretty recent add-on. Um, hopefully, since you're attending I2K, you are convinced of the value of quantitative image analysis, and especially in the age of the digital camera, this is now a lot easier because digital images are just arrays. Um, we, they are just sort of numbers that we put in a square and can say, this is the brightness at each number. And that's true for this little toy example. And it's true for, if you think about it, the smartphone camera pictures that you take, or this picture of a man taking a picture. Um, so we're able to get a tremendous amount of quantitative information. If you think about that, your microscope probably has a camera that's somewhere between one and eight megapixels. That's between one and eight million pieces of quantitative information in every picture that you take on that camera. So there's a lot of information here that can actually be used for quantification and even quantification of really quite subtle phenotypes, um, which is, of course, where bioimage analysis comes in. Um, and again, you're attending I2K, so you probably you're you're convinced of the value of this. But um, you know, as a reminder, or to your friends who to, something to show your friends who are not convinced of this yet, 
even if you think that you can see what's going on in your images. Um, and you know what we're going to be doing today is a classification where you are going to be using your own judgment to decide what's going on in the images. Um, your brain will try to trick you. And so that's where using classification tools as opposed to deciding what the classification is by looking at a few pictures is really valuable. So um, if you're looking at this on a small screen or when I first flashed it up, um, you might think this is a color picture. This is not a color picture. This is a gray picture with some colored lines drawn on it. And your brain, which is trying to give you idea about what's going on around you quickly, um, is filling in the missing information. This is great from an evolutionary standpoint. This is really bad from a bioimage analysis standpoint. And so tools like Cell Profiler and Cell Profiler Analysts are there to help you make really rigorous, um, properly quantified things that you simply can't do. Even if you're trying your absolute best to be very careful with a manual analysis because simply your brain is not up to the task. Um, so Cell Profiler uh, actually turns 20 this year. Um, it's a free and open source tool. It's available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, I mostly just want to show this slide to show the really fantastic uh, group of folks over the years who have contributed to the software. Um, and I think one of the things that's been valuable about Cell Profiler and Cell Profiler Analyst has been that there's always been a mix of folks on the development team um, who are professional sort of computer scientists or software engineers who I've highlighted here in blue, but also people who, like myself and like many other members of the team, um, uh, are, professional, are biologists by training. And so we've, I've highlighted those folks here in green. Um, and so a lot of effort has been put into both of these pieces of software to make sure that um, we are taking good computer science practices and good computer science concepts, but bringing them to the biologists in a way that is uses the language that biologists do to describe certain phenomenon and to make sure that we're that we're communicating with the people who are going to be using our software. Um, so you're here to learn Cell Profiler Analyst, but Cell Profiler Analyst is designed to be, though does not have to be, uh, used with Cell Profiler. Um, so the rough breakdown between these two pieces of software, Cell Profiler turns images into piles of spreadsheets. So Profiler Analyst turns piles of spreadsheets or databases into the answers to questions. Um, so Cell Profiler on its own will only generate measurements for you, but it will not actually answer any questions about what is going on in your experiment. Um, Cell Profiler Analyst will not generate any measurements for you, but if you provide it with images and measurements most easily from Cell Profiler, though you don't have to, um, it will then allow you to explore that data and come to some conclusions. Um, should have said this earlier, um, but certainly please do, um, if you have questions as we go, pop them into the chat. I'm trying my best to keep an eye on it or just unmute and ask. Um, we sometimes refer to these tools as measure everything and ask questions later uh, because Cell Profiler allows you again to sort of make these large numbers of measurements and then Cell Profiler Analyst allows you to actually answer the questions you want to use. Uh, that slide got duplicated somehow. Um, great. Um, so Cell Profiler, um, again, does, I'm going to just introduce you to it briefly because I, the principles of how we are putting together our analysis are going to be important for what we can conclude from our analysis. Anytime you're saying, I'm going to draw a conclusion based on X measurement, you kind of want to know how it's made. Um, and we're going to need to use Cell Profiler today to generate our files for Cell Profiler Analyst quickly. Cell Profiler, at its heart, is an image analysis workflow tool. Um, the sort of magic in Cell Profiler is this thing called the pipeline panel. What Cell Profiler does is it gives you about 100 different image analysis tasks that you could do. Some of these will be related to changing images, like you can see cropping here. Some of them will be related to objects, like finding objects, and some of them will be related to measurements. Um, but what Cell Profiler allows you to do is to put those things together in a way that's reproducible without needing to code. Coding is great if you're already an expert coder in one or more languages, fantastic. Um, but not everybody is and not everybody should need to be in order to generate measurements of their biological data. Um, and so Cell Profiler Analyst or Cell Profiler allows you to put together a workflow and apply it to however many images you have 
whether that's five or whether that's five million. Um, you can do the exact same analysis with the exact same settings for as many images as you point cell profiler at. Um, each one of these modules that you put into your pipeline uh, can then be configured. Um, this is the most important button in cell profiler. Um, this is the help button. Um, every single one of those modules and every single setting in every single module has help text that has been written and or reviewed by a biologist to help you understand what that particular module and what that particular setting is doing. There's a lot of functionality in Cell Profiler. It can make it very easy to get lost, even if like me, you've been using it for years. And so um, the module help button is always there to at least sort of help you guide your way back to where you need to get. Uh, Cell Profiler has two modes, a test mode, uh, where you're going to go through and test all of your settings and sort of configure your pipeline. This is where you'll get your FaceTime with Cell Profiler. But then once you've actually gone through and made sure that your settings work for a lot of different images, you can set your output folder and then you can start your analysis run. Um, and again, this will work on however many images you've told Cell Profiler to run on. Um, since this isn't really a cell profiler tutorial, uh, I'm going to just sort of very quickly um, go through some of the major things in cell profiler, but um, there was a fantastic introduction to cell profiler tutorial yesterday that hopefully many of you were able to attend where you would have seen some of this stuff. And if not, I certainly recommend once it goes up on the I2K channel to check this out on YouTube. We also have a Cell Profiler YouTube channel where you can check out uh, some introductory videos there. Um, so in Cell Profiler, you can adjust and add or subtract and reorder the, the steps that you're doing. Um, you can run individual steps. Um, you can decide to turn certain operations on and off. So you can test if something helps, and then if not, you can easily remove it. Um, you can ask Cell Profiler at each individual step to show you what it's doing or not. Uh, and it, we, it will try to warn you if there's a problem. So if there's something that isn't set correctly, there will be an indication in the pipeline. And if you actually hover over that uh, error message or that warning message, Cell Profiler will actually tell you what it's unhappy about. Um, and once you've tested your settings on one image, you can then test on the next. Um, getting analyses that are robust is very important to actually making sure you can trust the conclusions of your analysis. And once you've done that for several images, you can leave test mode and again, go into analysis mode and start running. Um, there's a lot of different things in Cell Profiler. Um, again, I said there's about 100 different modules. They're uh, organized into categories to make it easier for you to find what you need. Again, not a Cell Profiler tutorial, so I'm just going to sort of show this to you. Um, but again, um, certainly recommend uh, the intro to Cell Profiler tutorials that we have available. But the steps in general are always going to be to um, bring data into Cell Profiler. This is usually the part that everybody hates and is the most painful, <laughs> um, though we are certainly working on some fun new things for Cell Profiler 5 to hopefully make it a little bit easier. And if you do have trouble, we definitely recommend um, this uh, written blog post, which has links to a video tutorial that goes through the same material. And so uh, for about the 10 most common biological use cases, you can watch somebody set up the Cell Profiler input, input modules exactly the way you need them set up for your data. And whether you prefer written material or video, we've got an option for you both. So um, if you're having trouble getting data into Cell Profiler, I recommend this very strongly. Uh, a, a good high content analysis workflow is then going to typically follow three major steps. You're going to correct for known artifacts. In a perfect world, you wouldn't have to, but uh, very rarely is biology that kind. You're going to find the objects that you care about, and then you're going to add as many measurements as is practical. And I'm going to explain why the add the many measurements is really important in just a few minutes. So if why do I say correction? Um, so all classical image analysis segmentation works off of the principle, so not necessarily things like cell pose or Stardust uh, that use deep learning under the hood, but things like ImageJ, Cell Profiler, uh, and a lot of other tools that you're going to be more familiar with, 
work off of the principle, the thing I care about is bright and everything else is dark. If that's already the situation you have for the object that you care about that you want to find in your image, outstanding. Um, again, rarely is biology that kind though. Um, and rarely do you have a perfectly clean marker that is present only in the place you care about and nowhere else. So in order to find objects you care about, any transformation you can think of to do this is perfectly legal to do. You can do whatever you need to do to get there. This does not mean that you can do anything you want and then measure it. Um, so you want to be very careful about measuring only raw or appropriately corrected uh, images when you're making quantification. But for images that are going to be fed into a segmentation, um, you can do whatever you need to do in order to get it so that the only the things you care about are bright and everything else is dark. So that might mean getting rid of crud that fell in your well, which, you know, is an unfortunate real uh, aspect of doing microscopy, or you might to need to enhance dim signal that really is there, but is just not super bright. And as you do this, you're going to want to take a look at what your segmentations look like. Um, we don't offer anywhere near as many things as, say, Fiji does um, in Cell Profiler, but I do want to point out, if you're comfortable with a little bit of scripting and there's something from Fiji that you're missing, we do have a Cell Profiler module that runs Fiji macros. And so you can, if there is an image preprocessing step that you want that is present in ImageJ but not Cell Profiler, you can actually get it by running your local copy of ImageJ via Cell Profiler. Um, you're then going to find the objects that you care about. Um, and again, not every bioimage analysis workflow has to do with objects, but the vast majority of them in our experience do. People almost always want to find some object to, to measure something about. Um, in Cell Profiler, we tend to follow this idea of primary, secondary, and tertiary objects. And the primary objects for when you have a nuclear marker and when you're in a mononuclear context, so sorry, muscle cell biologists, um, uh, where you start by finding nuclei. Uh, and the reason for this is because nuclei dyes are tend to be pretty cheap. They tend to work pretty well and pretty clean. Um, and they're in a part of the spectrum where typically you don't have a lot of other markers. And, and nuclei are, if you're doing cell segmentation, are often a lot more spread out and easy to uh, pull apart than actual cells, which tend to like to be touching one another. Um, so uh, we are going to be providing you with a cell profiler pipeline today that you can go back and look at at your leisure if you would like. But you'll see that it follows this idea of starting with a prime, what's called a primary object that is the nucleus, creating a secondary object, which is just taking a first object and then making a second one and building the second object around the first one, and then making a tertiary object, which is taking those two objects and making a third. Um, so that will be what you see in your cell profiler pipeline today. You don't have to do this. You can have multiple primary objects. Um, you can have you know, one primary and many secondaries. There's a lot of different uh, ways to construct a pipeline, but this is the most common one. Uh, and once you've made objects, you can do things like filter them to only keep ones, say, that are GFP positive. You can expand them. You can shrink them. You can edit them manually, but we typically recommend that you don't because often the uh, amount of time you're going to spend doing that is going to be more than the actual data quality improvement you're going to get out. And then add as many measurements as is practical. Um, so Cell Profiler makes it very easy to add a lot of measurements. Most of these measurements are things that are found in lots of tools. In fact, at least one of the visualizations I'm going to show you, I stole from ImageJ. Um, but adding a lot of metrics, even once you're not sure whether or not you need, is actually really important and really valuable, and Cell Profiler makes it very easy to do. Um, so objects can, one of the most common metrics that people think about when they're thinking about object measurements is intensity. Especially if you're doing fluorescence, you have a marker for the thing that you care about. Uh, you say, how bright is my marker in my object? And, you know, you can always do things like find nuclei with DAPI and then measure the GFP intensity inside of them. This is one of the most common ones that people think about in terms of measurements. Um, and we can get even a little bit fancier with the intensity. We can measure things like the intensity distribution. So we can divide the cell into concentric rings and say, 
where is our signal within the cell? Is it sort of right at the edge? Is it right in the center? Is it uniformly distributed? And at each point between sort of the center and the edge, is it uniformly distributed or is it asymmetric? The asymmetry here often ends up being a really valuable um, biological marker for interesting phenotypes. Uh, size and shape is another one that I, uh, is often used and people are used to thinking about. So things like the area of your cells um, or the orientation, um, whether or not a cell looks more like a circle or more like a line. Yeah, and these are relatively human intuitable measurements. Um, and co-localization is sort of the, our other example of measurements that are going to be really, uh, really commonly used in a lot of biological workflows. So again, I stole this visualization from uh, Fiji, but these are images that we're going to be using in today's experiment. And you can see in our negative control images, there's, there's very bad co-localization between DAPI and GFP. And in our positive control images, there's very strong co-localization. Um, so when you see the metrics that you're going to be using in cell profiler analysts today, um, you will see a lot of these showing up. Um, and these are the kinds of metrics that you're going to use in order to actually, again, this is what you're going to all be generating a curve like this today that's going to allow you to calculate actual biological answers to questions. But there are measurements that might be worth adding to your pipeline that are a little bit harder to interpret. They're not things that necessarily fit well into human brains, but that doesn't make them not valuable. Um, so one thing that when you measure the size and shape of objects in cell profiler, that cell profiler would ask if you want to calculate are things like the Zernike polynomials. Now, if I tell you that uh, you added a drug to your cells and it made the cells twice as big, you probably have some ideas about why or how what that looks like or how you're going to do more experiments to test it. If I tell you you added a drug to your cells and it made the Zernike 4-0 polynomial um, twice as big, that probably isn't going to tell you anything. You're not going to get a picture in your head of what that looks like, and it's not necessarily going to suggest the next experiment to you. But even though each one of these metrics isn't actually sort of intuitable or useful on its own, when you add them up together, uh, if you look at these individual fluorescence microscopy images and how they have been reconstructed using Zernike polynomials, these reconstructions aren't perfect, but if you needed to know a lot about the shape of an object, this is going to tell you a lot more than just our perimeter, our eccentricity that says, is this a circle or is this a line? This is gonna actually give us a pretty reasonably detailed picture of what the cell shape looks like. So even though the metric doesn't make sense to the human brain on its own, it's still a useful descriptor. Um, and same with things like texture me measurements, which on their own maybe don't make a lot of sense. If I tell you the info measure at scale three is, is high, that probably you think that I'm having a stroke or something, but in fact, um, it is a useful measurement. It's just not one that always makes sense to human brains. So why? What's the point of doing that? <laughs> um, you're just telling me to make metrics that don't make sense. So the thing is that there are, there's information that is hidden in images. I started here by saying, you know, human brains are bad quantification machines. Um, these are imaging flow cytometry images from various cell cycle phases. Um, who wants to tell me what cell cycle phase all of these individual cells are in? Nobody ever says yes to that. Um, and that's because it's hard. This is a hard task for a human brain. You know, sort of towards the end here where you're seeing the cell is dividing, you probably have some ideas. Um, and the fact that then it, the cell seems to be going through a process, you could have maybe guessed that this is how things were arranged. But certainly if I scrambled these three and said unscramble them, you would probably have a very hard time. But based on things like those texture measurements that I just mentioned, um, a computer can do this really well. Um, there are DAPI images associated with these, which uh, an actual human used to sort of say, well, these G1, S, G2. Um, but then based only on these bright fields, um, when we ask cell profiler analysts to classify this based on measured texture features, it can do a really nice job. And even the mistakes that it makes, you know, S isn't ever being confused for metaphase. It's that S is sometimes looking like G1 or sometimes G2, but the switch from G1 to S and from S to G2, those aren't actually perfectly switch-like. We're not seeing confusion really at any level between G1 and G2, 
Um, it's to some degree a matter of the fact that we're forcing these things to be in very discrete little bins and biology is often weird and messy. So there's information here so in these metrics that are not intuitable to our brain that can still tell us about phenotypes that we really want to know about. And so maybe you're lucky, maybe the phenotype you care about is super easily described with one particular uh, metric. And so here, if we look at the log of the integrated intensity of the nucleus here, this is sort of real data from a paper that uh, used cell profiler to say, to look for drugs that were causing cells to um, endoreduplicate and have more DNA inside them and get stuck in sort of higher and higher logs of DNA content. If you're lucky enough that one measurement uh, gets you where you want to go, great. Maybe two measurements get you where you want to go. So if you want to look at cell cycle, for example, if you have a DNA marker and a phospho H3 marker, often two markers are all you need to get to get all of these uh, different cell cycle phases. But if, say, I want to differentiate between all of these different kinds of uh, shape phenotypes, I personally have no idea what's the right uh, measurements to do this. Um, there are a lot of weird and wacky things we often want to quantify in biology. And so rather than you having to try to figure out what is the one measurement that distinguishes this from this from this from this, um, we can let computers do what computers are good at, which is figure out rules that associate things. And so that's where adding as many measurements as you practically can um, and then asking questions later um, can actually really come to a lot of benefit. So cell profiler analyst is designed to take all of those measurements. So here we have this idea where essentially for each cell, if we think about it, we can think about it as an array. And for each cell, any given measurement might be up or down. And then we can take a look and see if there are patterns there that come out as interesting. Um, so we use a number of these functionalities in cell profiler analyst today, but uh, it allows you to do things like um, make classes, to look at plates in a plate viewer, um, to just sort of look at tables of data, to make scatter plots. And so all of these things that once you've measured more measurements than you think that you need, you can then go in and explore and see which ones are actually connected to the biology that you care about. Um, the major thing that cell, um, there are a lot of things that offer sort of plotting functionality. The major thing that cell profiler analyst is going to give you access to is the classification. And again, that's what you're going to spend a lot of the time in today's exercise doing. Um, so this classification is ultimately machine learning. If you're used to hearing a lot about deep learning, which you probably are lately, um, there's not a whole machine learning and deep learning are related, but not exactly the same thing. Cell profiler analysts are typically not going to be doing deep learning, and deep learning is often not very intuitable in the sense of we don't know what parts of the cell typically are driving a classification between something, uh, a, a deep learning model calling something, you know, positive versus negative for a phenotype. Um, but with classical machine learning, machine learning that's based on measurements, we can do exactly that. So what we're going to do today um, is, uh, and what cell profiler analyst in general allows you to do, is just take a list of cells, um, each of which comes with its own list of measurements. And in this hypothetical example, if we only care about these sort of yeasty looking cells, we can say, yes, this is a cell that is positive for the phenotype I care about. This is not. This is. This is not. This is not and so on and so forth. And what computers are very good at doing then is coming up with lists of rules. So if we've added enough measurements that there are some measurements that whenever they're up or whenever they're up and something else is down or whenever three of them are up and two of them are down actually help us distinguish these again, sort of vaguely yeasty looking cells from the other ones. And you can do this in an iterative process. And as you'll see today, we're gonna in, of only about an hour actually allow you to do this to uh, create a classifier based on some cell profiler uh, measurements. And so uh, this is often called human in the loop machine learning because the human is going in and sort of taking a look to see if the rules are good. Um, and um, then uh, you will get 
in addition to your classes and getting all your objects classified, you will have the list of rules. And so you can see, is self profiler analyst using features that make sense or that seem right? If it's using, you know, for our translocation thing, if it's saying nuclear intensity is up in our translocated cells, that's probably a good rule. If it's saying that the Y position of that cell or uh, is in a certain part of the image, then it might be a bad rule and that might mean we need to do more training. Um, there's a question here um, about importing Fiji ROIs into Cell Profiler Analyst. Um, there isn't a way I can think of to do that easily. There are certainly ways you can use scripts to turn Fiji ROIs into objects, and so that would work, um, but there's not a direct path, but that's a really interesting idea, and that's something we can certainly think about um, going forward. Great question. Happy to have more questions. Um, so I'm going to just quickly actually do my wrap-up slides for the end here, um, just so that um, for folks, if folks have to drop off early and leave early, um, again, we're going to go through now and do a hands-on exercise. We're not actually finished. Um, but if you want to know more about how to learn to do use Cell Profiler or Cell Profiler Analyst, you want to know where to go for help, um, I can't recommend strongly enough forum.image.sc. Um, so there's about 60, at this point, open source image analysis software tools that we all share one common help forum. And you can go on and you can, uh, you can sort of, first of all, search the tens of thousands of posts that are there. And if you're having a problem, see if somebody else has had the same problem already and see if they've gotten it fixed. And if not, you can ask people. And um, often the people, if you're asking a question about cell profiler or cell profiler analyst, um, who will be answering you are the fantastic TAs that, again, you'll have a chance to interact with later today. Um, and um, the, they'll be able to help you with any questions that you have. If even after working on the forum, you're still having trouble, we do have office hours, um, which are held every two weeks, um, usually every two weeks through most of the year. Um, and you can always sign up for these, um, and we're happy to help you out. Um, Need uh, required disclosure. This is all funded by the Center for Open Bioimage Analysis, um, where we work with biologists to help make image analysis software and image analysis workflow solutions to challenging biological projects that they have. So if that sounds like you, again, please do reach out to us via that office hour form or via our website. Um, we're always looking for new folks that we can collaborate with and help them solve difficult problems. And people paid for this, so I just have to make sure to show this slide. And I also want to make, take a second to acknowledge the amazing folks in the group who make really great tools and really great educational materials. Um, but we're not actually done um, because we are going to now do an exercise um, where, again, as a reminder, we are going, or for those of you who are here late, we are going to be using Cell Profiler and then Cell Profiler Analyst. Um, in order to distinguish the amount of drug that it takes to cause translocation of this particular transcription factor from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. Um, and first, we're going to use Cell Profiler, anybody who has Cell Profiler on their computer and was able to um, access the materials. Um, Shada has been kind enough to put those in the chat a couple times. Um, if not, you can, uh, you can grab those materials now. Um, and then we will go into a breakout rooms and uh, use Cell Profiler Analyst in Teams. So um, hopefully most of you now can work with me together and we'll do this together in real time to make some files for Cell Profiler Analyst. Um, but if you're not able to do that, um, you can still help out uh, in the breakout rooms. Before we actually start doing the hands-on exercise, um, were there any questions that came up uh, that have not already been shared in the chat? Please feel free to unmute or to pop more things in the chat. All right. Um, again, feel free as we go to, uh, in classifying cell types, can fluorescence intensity be used? Absolutely yes, as long as you've measured it. Anything you've measured can be used, um, and probably what you will see is that uh, fluorescence intensity will be used in the classification that you're going to do today. Uh, so if you've downloaded the materials, you should have um, a folder that has five files in it. Um, I want everyone to start by opening up translocation.pdf. Um, 
So whether or not you are the person using Self Profiler Analyst in your room, um, this is the file that's going to explain what the exercise is. Um, exercise one, we're going to actually, uh, uh, can someone repost the link in the chat, please? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, exercise one, we're actually not doing today. So this is learning how to actually use Self Profiler to create this workflow in the first place. Again, it's a great thing to learn to do. Um, we have some videos on doing it, but it's not what you're here to learn today. Um, so we are going to skip all of exercise one, and we're going to start from exercise two, which is using Self Profiler Analyst to do this. Um, but if you are the person in your breakout room who is the person who is guiding the person using Self Profiler Analyst, um, this is what you're going to be using to help with. Uh, we're starting at the bottom of page nine. Um, but for everyone who does have the files in Cell Profiler, which I will sort of stall just a minute in order to allow folks to get that, um, what we've provided you here is a folder called Translocation Data, which has a number of images in it. And it also has a CSV file in it. Um, now, you might not have this always when you yourself are running Cell Profiler Analyst on your actual data. But Cell Profiler allows you the ability to bring in external metadata in about an experiment when you're doing the analysis. So in this case, uh, we're going to do exactly that. And the external metadata we're going to bring in is in each well, um, is it a control well or not? And what was the dose of drug given? Because what we're trying to see is how much drug does it take to cause translocation, you can see um, that you know, we're going to really need this information. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to load in a pre-made cell profiler pipeline. We're going to load in pre-made uh, pre data, and then we're going to load this in. Now, you don't have to do this again with your own data, but think about future you two years from now, who's now trying to remember what was in the plate that I ran in October of 2023 versus the plate I ran in November of 2023. If that information is already right next to your cell measurements, you can't forget it, you can't lose it, it can't get confused. And so uh, it takes a little bit of time to sort of make a file like this and set it up, but it is often really worth it, again, just so that all of your treatment metadata sits right next to your measurements and those things can never then get unlinked. Um, how easy and uncomplicated is it to manage cell painting data using Cell Profiler Analyst? Um, Manage is a, is a word that can cover a lot of things. So um, you can certainly open cell painting data in Cell Profiler Analyst. Um, and in fact, uh, those of you who did the Intro to Cell Profiler workshop yesterday, that's exactly what we did. Um, we were using cell painting data. Um, a lot of things that you might look for with cell painting, which for those of you who aren't familiar, cell painting is an assay where you add a lot of organelle dyes to look for phenotypes. Um, some of the phenotypes in cell painting are visible and some of them are not. And so something like this, where you're, you have a human visible phenotype, you can find that in cell painting data using Cell Profiler Analyst. But a lot of the things in cell painting are really subtle things that are not visible to human brains and human eyes. So in that sense, you're almost always going to need something beyond cell profiler analysts to look at cell painting. But that's a great question. Um, what version of cell profiler should be used to open the pipeline? I believe anything in the 4.2 um, thing is fine, but let me just double check um, what the version is. Realistically, anything in 4.2 should be fine, even if this is later than 4.2.1, but there's no harm in just sort of checking, because cell profiler pipelines are just text files. Yeah, so anything in 4.2 should be fine. I can't promise for anything early, like anything that's sort of 4.1, and certainly things that are cell profiler 3 will not work. Um, you are welcome, Rocco. Uh, all right, hopefully enough stalling. Um, oh, Victor, I'm sorry to hear you were having the Sonoma crashing issue. Um, it is almost certainly something to do with how we build Cell Profiler. We are on it, but since we just found out about it last night, we are not, we have not fixed it yet. <laughs> um, uh, but again, please do stick around because there are certainly other ways you can contribute. Um, Hopefully those of you who have uh, who are not on Mac Sonoma and who have downloaded Cell Profiler and Cell Profiler Analyst and the data are with us now. Um, 
So I've opened my copy here of Cell Profiler. Um, there are two .cp pipe, which are our Cell Profiler pipeline files provided here. If we were doing the whole thing, we would start from start, but we're not. We're going to trust that um, the people who made this final pipeline did a good job with it. And so where it says drop a pipeline file here, which is the left-hand side of Cell Profiler, I'm going to drop this pipeline. If you've dropped it to the right place, you should see this load pipeline question. You can also do file import pipeline if drag and drop is not something that you prefer for whatever reason. So again, pipeline file goes here. Um, so in fact, our image files are going to go here where it says drop files and folders here. So again, uh, let me stop annotating. <laughs> um, uh, good to know, Rocco. Um, for pipelines, you have to use import, not open. Um, it's a little tricky. Um, so your translocation data, the whole folder, you should be able to just sort of drop right here. Um, and you should then see, um, I believe it's 52 images and one CSV. Although when I then hit apply filters to look at only images, um, we'll then just have our 52 images. Questions before I go on? There's only a couple more things we need to do before we're ready to get underway. But data files go here, pipeline files go here. Um, and if you run into issues with this and nobody else in your breakout room is up and running, when the TAs start going into the breakout rooms, we will happily help you out. Um, the only thing that we do need to configure here, let me clear out the annotations, um, that we are going to need to do um, is we need to tell Cell Profiler where that metadata CSV is. Everything else is configured, um, you know, for what Cell Profiler is, but what Cell Profiler does not know is where you put that file because we we don't know that we do not uh, we do not know exactly how your computer is set up or where you like to download things. So if you go to the metadata uh, tab, which is going to be right under images, it's right here. You should see something that looks like this. Um, you're going to see a Python regular expression, which don't worry about it too much about exactly what that is. But if you want to know why it's there, it's there because it's helping you figure out based on the file name, which well each image came from. We said that we want to know what dose each, uh, each well is treated with, with drugs. So we need to know um, for each well is which images are in that well so that we can associate pictures with doses. And, and which is how we will associate doses with phenotypes. Um, so you don't need to do anything there. I'm just, you don't need to even open it up. I'm just opening it up to show you. What you do need to do is scroll down. Um, if you can't already see where it says metadata file name, um, but hopefully you can, in which case you don't need to scroll down. And here you are now going to click this button on Windows, it will look slightly different, but it will still look like a folder being opened. And you are going to tell Cell Profiler where you put the file, um, which will again be in the translocation data folder that we gave you. So in my case, it's on the desktop, translocation data, and this CSV. Um, give folks a second to get there, but again, metadata metadata file name, and wherever you happened to put this file, uh, this is what you need to do. Okay. So when I hit update here, if I've done that correctly, I should see dose here in the list of pieces of metadata that are associated with every particular image. Um, 
if you don't see dose and if this was something that uh, you were having difficulty doing, again, when we put you into the breakout rooms, either somebody else can be the person operating cell profiler um, or the TAs can help you out. Um, the last thing we just need to do is to now actually run cell profiler. So we're going to next hit output settings and tell cell profiler where you want things to save. Um, so you want to then change your default output folder. So I am going to stop annotating. <laughs> um, and then I am going to just say that I'm going to make a new folder on my desktop. Uh, nope, I want it right on my desktop. Thank you. Once you've done that, the last thing to do is just to hit Analyze. Uh, I want to stress that uh, you should not then move either the input files or the output files between when you start this and when you then uh, are trying to run Subprofiler Analyst. So uh, keep everything where it is once you've made this decision of where things are going to live. All right. I am now going to go ahead and hit Analyze. So Cell Profiler is automatically going to multi-thread for as many cores as your computer has or as many cores as you've told it it's allowed to use. In my case, I've told it it's only allowed to use four. That's because I was doing something very memory intensive earlier. Um, the first image it always processes by itself. And so the, the first image, the estimated time to completion is always a lie um, because it doesn't know how long it takes for the first image to go and it isn't multi-threading on the first image. But once it has finished the next batch of images and it's now running in my case four at a time, um, we've now gone from one finished to five finished and this time to completion has gone down now to about three minutes. And that's gonna continue to drop even further because this is, um, being driven partly by the fact that the first time I was only doing one at a time, and now I'm doing four at a time. So this should only actually take about a minute or two. Um, so that's all that we're um, that the person who's operating cell profile is going to need to do. Again, if if this is not working on your computer for whatever reason, um, you are there is still a role for you in helping figure out what's going on in cell profiler analyst. Um, but again, uh, if you've been following along, your cell profiler should be done or very close to done. Any last questions before we send you to your breakout rooms? Is the export file type important? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so cell profiler in terms of um, outputs for images, you can have several. Um, for measurements, you can have either um, databases or spreadsheets. Um, here we're using SQLite. Um, you can use a MySQL host if you have it set up. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Um, SQLite is essentially a fancy wrapper around a pile of spreadsheets. Um, in most cases, it doesn't matter. It's whatever you're comfortable working with, but cell profiler analyst, because it needs to, for example, understand the connection between your images and all of your objects, needs it to be some sort of a database. Um, SQLite is typically the easiest because, again, this is just a fancy wrapper around pile of spreadsheets. Um, and there are free viewers such as DB Browser that you can use for opening SQLite files. Um, so. If you're not using Cell Profiler Analyst, um, use whatever you're comfortable with. If you are using Cell Profiler Analyst, this is our recommendation. Great question. Is it possible to use multi-channel stacks as input? Yes, uh, absolutely. And again, I, I will uh, recommend you take a look at that input modules tutorial. Um, can you do this with Z stacks? Um, yes, asterisk. Um, so you can certainly do Z projection in Cell Profiler. 
Um, there is, in cell profiler, if you are cell profiler analyst, if you install it directly in Python, you can do 3D. Um, we haven't actually put out a working release of cell profiler analyst um, that you can download from our website that has this 3D functionality. But it's something that we've we've made, and the next time we release cell profiler analyst um, will be included. Um, you won't be able to see the whole Z stack. It will just for the classifier be the center slice. But um, that is something we know that people are interested in having. Great questions. Other questions? All right. In that case, um, we are going to send you to your breakout rooms where, again, you'll have TAs popping in and out, so you will have more chances to ask questions of them. Um, the exercise should take you about an hour, so we should be done pretty close to uh, close to on time. Um, but certainly um, the TAs will help you figure out if you're, if things aren't taking as long. Um, uh, Maria, I'll answer your question um, offline. Um, but yeah, uh, TAs, if you can go ahead and open up the breakout rooms and uh, we will see you folks shortly. So other than to remind folks that, um, forum.image.sc uh, is a great place to ask for help whenever you need it. And then again, we do have um, office hours where you can come and ask sort of more detailed questions. Um, I hope everybody found this exercise useful um, and saw that uh, with, with the right tools, machine learning doesn't have to be scary. Uh, and we hope that this is something that you can take on and use uh, in your own work going forward. Any final thoughts? We need to wrap up in just a second, but. Okay, well, sincerely, thank you everyone for spending two hours of your life with us. We know everybody's time is precious. Um, it was great to have you all and have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful rest of I2K.